Good morning, everyone. As Santiago was mentioning in his opening comments, we've just started to unpack some of the complexities and challenges around addressing food and nutrition security. And today we're going to be, this morning we're going to be talking about the partnership elements in that. The move towards more multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary approaches in research has been a significant trend in recent decades. And there's a growing recognition of the need to not only work across disciplines, but also sectors, as we've been discussing. That's why this was one of the Canadian International Food Security Research Fund, or CIFSURF, one of our key objectives, to build partnerships between Canadian and Southern organizations and work directly with farmers, researchers, the public and private sector, and civil society organizations, as all of these groups have impo important roles to play in addressing these issues. From 2009 to 2018, and there'll be a slide coming up soon to show you this, we had 167 organizations involved in CIFSR from the life of the program. And that number I just wanted to mention was the number of organizations that were involved counting from the start of the program, but it didn't actually include all the organizations that were added on over the life of all these projects. So the number could be around closer to 300. And these included a gamut of specific expertise depending on the focus of the projects, which ranged from soil science, biotechnology, participatory plant breeding, vaccinology, aquaculture, rural development, gender, nutrition and food science, public health, business management, social anthropology, microfinance, agribusiness, ICTs, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sorry if I haven't mentioned your discipline, but we know you were involved. The composition of the partnerships within each project was dependent on the innovation and the scaling pathway, and we're going to be talking more about that um, this afternoon after lunch. The complexities and the challenges addressed in the projects demanded a high level of cooperation in the teams in order to integrate the methods, the data, the concepts from two or more disciplines and sectors, and um, to be able to find complementary roles in that as well. And as you can imagine, successfully managing these types of partnerships is by no means a simple thing. Two of our key lessons from CIFSURF are that building shared goals and a shared vision is key to successful collaboration. And that it's essential to engage with all the relevant stakeholders, as we've been hearing yesterday, at the earliest stages of the research to ensure a wide adoption of appropriate and relevant innovations. The teams built up knowledge on ways of working together only by actually working together. So of course, this required the time and the space where the different partners could come together to recognize the diversity of skills and perspectives, identified shared areas of interest, develop a common language and a shared understanding, and exchange ideas. And capacity building took place at all levels from project leadership and management learning just how to work in these large um, multi-sector projects. There was also cross-learning between the laboratory and field staff and training of students and farmers. And as Frank mentioned in his closing comments yesterday, for Canadian partners, CIFSURF provided access to international opportunities and the vital knowledge and networks of regional development partners. The projects raised the level and understanding of development issues among Canadian scientists and helped them navigate the different cultural contexts. They learned how to adapt re research methods to suit unstable field conditions and increase their understanding and appreciation of the policy needs in the Global South. For Southern Partners, CIFSURF collaboration offered access in some cases to expertise in agriculture and nutrition sciences and regulatory issues, as we'll be hearing about shortly. And in other cases, Canadian university partners offered cutting edge testing facilities, technologies, and experimental techniques that wouldn't have otherwise been available to the teams. As you've been seeing and hearing about in these partnerships, they've resulted in new scientific discoveries, They've built new skills and knowledge. They've raised additional funding for research. They've extended networks to scale up the innovations and reach more farmers. And you heard from Alejandra yesterday, and we'll be hearing from Hussein and Crystal later on today about the significant graduate student capacity that's been built, both amongst Canadian and Southern researchers involved. 
There were 406 graduate students involved, and about 60% of those were women. Um, 63 Canadian and just over 300 um, southern graduate students and 10 from other countries, mostly European countries. 20 of the 39 projects leveraged an additional 40 million Canadian dollars in additional research funds to carry out uh, the research activities. And while the, um, the number of, the, of scientific publications isn't the only indicator of successful partnerships, it's one that I wanted to mention Throughout the life of the projects, um, they produced to date 471 peer-reviewed articles as of now, and there'll be many more coming. As you know, this sometimes takes a number of years to have a publication uh, out. 375 theses, 87 books or book chapters, and 72 policy briefs. And about 80% of the CIFSR projects in phase two built on pre-existing relationships, and that's important to note. In addition to their long-standing connections, the partnerships were strengthened by memoranda of understanding that specified terms of the collaboration, steering committees that enhanced coordination and guided uh, their adjustments, project coordinators who kept communications and reporting on track, and regular meetings and open communication amongst all the team members. So this session is going to explore some of the challenges and key learnings in how to build successfully, uh, re successful research partnerships. And while all of our projects could be up here sharing lessons on how to do that, we only have time to, to introduce three of them. So I'd like to um, introduce three lead scientists who are involved in uh, some of the CIFSERF projects. Professor Hortense Atadiello from the Université Nangui à Brogua in Côte d'Ivoire. Dr. Andy Potter from the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization based at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Jay Subramanian at the University of Guelph. And I think we'll, we'll start with Hortense, if you'd like to come up. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. I have the honor to present to you this morning the project on the fight against uh, the lethal yellowing disease um, it's in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. I'm going to give you the context first of all. We are on the uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, in where the population consumes these as a basic food, but where there is some income from palm trees. In the last 10 years, there has been a disease that has been killing them. Voici un here is an image Here is an image that shows you what these uh, coconuts look like. It looks like a, like a telephone post forest and everything. There's a lot of devastation. 25,000 farmers are affected in Côte d'Ivoire. What is our challenge as researchers? We want to know what kills them in this region of Côte d'Ivoire and what are the solutions that we can find to fight against this. So we had to find solutions. Our innovations were on knowledge production, new knowledge production. We had to study the disease identified. How is it transmitted, the socioeconomic environment, what is the impact of this disease in the last 10 years 
All this was necessary to understand the disease. We also shared this information in training sessions for producers, students, researchers, and extension agents, and even policymakers. We used all these channels, uh, plant clinics for producers and field schools. We have disseminated this information to the different stakeholders so that all together we can find some solutions. Our key results, we have identified the disease. From now on, we know what is killing the trees. We know the insects that are transmitting the disease. We also found uh, biological uh, fight agents. We have also trained 2,700 producers and extension agents so that they can identify and control the disease. And lastly, we helped women to create groups. That was the first time in this zone so that they can start to produce the basic staples, but also make some money. Unfortunately, at the end of the project, we found that the same disease also attacks uh, cassava. So what are the lessons learned? To be able to do this work, we need collaborative research. We worked with partnership. We worked in uh, with partners. Uh, Metrics in Toronto. The representative Emma Rocha is here in this room. We also learned that we had to share that each partner brings their own expertise and knowledge. And we exchange with it, with extension agents, producers, and farmers because they have to continue this work. We also learned that, bef that without the local population, the mayor, the perfect prefects, um, and villages, it would be impossible. We also had the support of our government, uh, policymakers uh, who, have, uh, who participated in our conferences and learned from us. This is the recipe that we need to do the work that we are presenting here. So ladies and gentlemen, collaborative research or participatory research is instrumental in this kind of research on uh, diseases if we want to find solutions. I would like to end here by thanking sincerely IDRC and Global Affairs Canada who truly contributed and helped us have hope for our population in Côte d'Ivoire. Dot, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am here to talk about the second vaccine project. You heard about the first yesterday uh, from David Wallace, and David did a wonderful job introducing vaccines in general in Africa, and so I'm not going to repeat what he had to say, other than to, to mention that infectious diseases, whether one looks at animals, whether one looks at humans, humans are just another animal species, uh, cause more deaths on the planet than anything else every year. And of course, vaccines are a very proactive way of trying to mitigate the threat of these infectious diseases. I'm here uh, talking on behalf of Vito Intervac. Uh, Calro in Nairobi, Kenya, has run Wasanga, is over on the, uh, my right-hand side, uh, and as well, ILRI, the International Livestock uh, Research Institute in Nairobi, who was the third partner. So CBPP. Uh, was the target uh, of our research. This is contagious bovine pleuropneumonia caused by a bacterial species, so a little bit different than what you heard David talk about yesterday. And uh, it, it's an important disease in Africa. It, it can cause anywhere up to a billion dollars in economic losses. The peer-reviewed literature has quite a range uh, of, of losses. I, I suspect it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 million 
Uh, those are Canadian dollars. And we have vaccines that have worked elsewhere in the world. This used to be a global disease. We had it in Canada 100 years ago. And it's been eradicated uh, or eliminated from the rest of the world through the use of vaccination. Unfortunately, the vaccines that are available, these are live vaccines, and this is a bacteria. Uh, so there are many issues that simply make it incompatible with control in Africa. The first is thermostability. Uh, you need a cold chain, absolutely, for, for this vaccine to work. And as well, it causes pretty severe tissue reactivity in animals that are vaccinated. Not a good thing. Um, antimicrobial use is a problem. Of course, you can't use antibiotics if you're vaccinating with a live vaccine, uh, a live bacterial vaccine, or it won't work. And uh, movement of animals. In Canada, Australia, the United States, and elsewhere, the vaccine has worked because there have been restrictions put on animal movement. That is extremely difficult to do in countries such as Kenya, uh, where our work was focused. So we were charged with developing a new vaccine. And uh, very briefly, I'm not here to talk about the science. This vaccine was developed using computational methods. And computational methods, the, the rationale for that was simple speed. It was quicker to do it this way, removed human bias from the equation. Um, and the prototype vaccine at the end of the, uh, the first phase of the research was shown by Hezron and his group to be 81% 80, uh, effective relative to 22% for the existing vaccine in an African setting. And th this is a, a level of efficacy where one can talk about elimination of disease. The, uh, the uptake of the vaccine uh, was predicted by the socioeconomic group to actually be good, but of course it depended on cost. And all that tells me, of course, is that a farmer in Kenya is no different than a farmer in Canada. It comes down to the bottom line. I would add that we, we have commercialized similar vaccines to this in Canada, and the, the cost is actually less than one cent to produce. Uh, so they are amazingly cheap. The bottle is the most expensive part of this vaccine. And as well, the, the scale up of this vaccine by Kevavapi in Nairobi has started uh, and has gone very well. And it's resulted in a number of new production processes that are ap applicable not only to this vaccine, but a variety of other that one could envision in the future. So the key results in terms of partnerships, there's been a good partnership formed with regulatory agent, the regulatory agency in Kenya, uh, as well as other African countries. And I, I would add that the synergy and the partnerships between the two vaccine projects has really enabled this work to go forward. Without that, uh, I doubt that either of us would have been successful. Manufacturing partnerships have been expanded beyond Kevavapi. Uh, that includes uh, at least two other companies. One is a northern African country in Morocco, uh, and the other a subsidiary of a European company. And we expect the return on investment for this vaccine to be about 20 to 1. And if you think about it, that is an amazing payoff. And most of that money is going to go to the small-scale farmer. So if we could do this all over again, what would we do different? Um, the regular regulatory partnerships took a long time to develop, much longer than we thought they would. Uh, and really, they need to start before the actual science starts. And ditto for the, uh, the business relationships. Uh, we've done a lot of work on, on commercializing vaccines. The issue here was that you've got an NGO, uh, you've got a private sector organization, or two private sector organizations, and a, and a university-based organization. And trying to get all of them on the same page was extremely difficult and actually took the better part of three years. Uh, this needs to be ironed out up front. The end point of this research, I think IDRC and uh, many of us in the project differ. Uh, eradication is a term that uh, people like to use. This is a bacterium. You're not going to eradicate it. Uh, you can eliminate it. You can control the disease, but it's not going to be eradicated. And it's important because it affects how one moves forward. And with that, uh, I will end.
Good morning, everybody. I'm here to talk about the impact of collaborative research on our project Enhanced Preservation of Fruits Using Nanotechnology. As you can see, this project involves six countries, Canada, India, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Tanzania, Trinidad, and Tobago, two NGOs, 35 researchers, and in over 150 farms in these countries. The challenge before us is the post-harvest loss of fruits. Globally, it is estimated that we are losing almost 50 million tons of fruits, and that is going to cost us lots of billions of dollars. And as an example, one crop, mango alone, in India, we are losing about 5 million tons of fruit that translates to about 1 billion US every year. Even if we capture 25% of that, that is $250 million, that can be put to a lot of use, obviously, and everybody would be itching to get their hands on that. The solution or the innovation that we have come out with uh, to combat this issue is a natural product called hexanol. Hexanol is there in every fruit and vegetables, and we all have eaten hexanol. If you had eaten one of these bubble gums in your life, you had eaten hexanol. It is there in the wrapper saying that artificial and natural flavoring agent, and hexanol is one of those flavoring agents. And instead of just using hexanol in just one method, which may or may not be applicable to all the farmers, we used a nanotechnology-driven approach to deliver hexanol in various forms. Either you can spray on the tree before the harvest, or you can dip the fruits on that, or you can just use hexanol as a vapor, or mix hexanol in the bio-wax that is already used to coat apples, pears, and so many other fruits. Or you can use nanotechnology to develop some of these uh, 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 nice fibers, as you can see in that one, which can be stuck on the cardboard. And as the fruits are shipped from one place to another, they breathe and they emanate humidity, and that humidity is enough to drive the hexanol out, and hexanol keeps the fresh. So a mango that is shipped from India, when it reaches Canada, would still be fresh instead of looking like a Santa Claus growing on that. And other method is that we have developed little pellets and sashes, and these things cost less than one cent a kilo to treat. That is less than one cent a kilo. And with these things, you can keep the fruits fresh for much longer time. And what is the impact of this one? This is what is happening. The control fruits always spoil pretty quickly, whereas the treated fruits remain fresh for much longer time. On an average, it extends the harvesting period between one to four weeks. Of course, this varies with the crop, varies with the location, varies with the type of culture, everything. And there is longer shelf life of the fruits that were treated with hexanol. And in mango, for instance, it takes at least three weeks before the rot sets in in hexanol treated fruits. In bananas, it is six weeks, and so on and so forth. And because of this extended availability, there is a stability in the price. And farmers get better price for their produce, which is not happening in many of the global south. And the consumers always pay a fair price. You are not going to get it cheap one day and then pay out of your nose for another day. So there will be a stability in price as well. In addition, it has resulted in at least 15% employment for women, particularly in the global south, mainly because women are the ones who are involved in the packaging of bananas, mangoes, and other fruits. So they get additional 15% of income through that. The reach of nanotechnology, before 2012, even the researchers have not heard of the word hexanol. And now in India alone, it has reached over 12,000 farmers. In the six countries we tested, it has reached 26,000 farmers. The numbers might seem modest. That is because, just like uh, the previous speaker, we are also faced with regulatory issues. And regulatory issues are going to be very different in different countries. How did we achieve that? Using a very strong collaboration. And we had right at the beginning delineated roles for each of the countries and each of the partners, and everybody had a clear objective. And some countries did not take up certain objectives because they don't need it or they don't have the technology to do that. And it is our job to bring them up to speed, and that's what we achieved in this project. And the lessons, key lessons learned, 
The Canadian discovery of hexanol is working and is adapted global in the global south, and it will be adapted globally, including Canada in the years to come. And one of the reasons uh, that it is getting a little bogged down, research is one thing, commercialization is a totally another ball game, which as researchers we were not aware of at the beginning, and that is governed by different rules in different countries. And these regulatory issues are there in every country, but irrespective of the country, they ask for one question, is this product safe? And that's why we developed that book, Biosafety of Hexanol, where we tested it on nine different trophic levels, which is recommended by the international unions, and it is there, and we have proved that it is absolutely safe. And in spite of those regulatory hurdles, we have already advanced it in India and Sri Lanka, and in the next few years, it will be here in Canada as well for the farmers to use. Thank you. Merci. Nandri. Asante. Gracias. I'd like to thank our, our panelists for their presentation. So we heard from Hortense about the complex global network and experts that were needed to address uh, the disease and identify the vector involved. We heard from Andy about the synergies between the two vaccine projects and the expanded partnership that was necessary and some of the regulatory channel, uh, challenges that Jay also addressed in his, um, in a project that, uh, was it, that involved uh, six, six countries and you had nine innovations. Um, and now I'd like to move to uh, our two external panelists who are joining us to, to give us uh, some perspectives outside of the CIFSURF program. We have with us uh, Ms. Anne Gabory, President and CEO of Développement International des Jardins, based in Lévis, Quebec. And we have Dr. Ignacia Fernandez, the Executive Director of REMISP, or the Centro Latinoamericano Latin para el Desarrollo Rural, or the Latin American Center for Rural Development, based in Santiago, Chile. And I think we'll, we'll start with Anne first. Um, so I had a question for both of you. Um, and Day Day was a pioneer in the development and deployment of microfinance, also known as community finance around the world, which also relies on complementary partnerships. What did you find exciting in what you know about CIFSURF's work so far, what you've been hearing over, the, over these two days, particularly around partnerships? And what are some of the key gaps that you feel that we need to focus on moving forward? Well, two interesting questions. Um, these three projects are very interesting, and uh, as a practitioner, uh, we are really impressed by the huge potential impacts of these innovation, and consequently, we are very concerned about their dissemination. So what did we learn from these projects about partnership? I understand that partnership in the research phase may mean something very large. Uh, we talk about several research centers, several different universities, several countries, north, south. So it, it may be a lot of organization. I understand also that the nature of the partnership may be very different in the research phase than in the scaling phase. So the choice of the partners seems strategic and must be made to support the goal of the project, find a solution or disseminate. So we talk about the right mix of partners. First point to remind, timing is also an important point. For example, we heard that we should join the government earlier maybe before the project, if we need a change in the legal framework. We should conclude partnership with the private sector earlier if we want to support commercialization of an innovation. So being part of the group at the right moment is also important. And finally, we also heard about the rela or see relationship between partners. Uh, people talked about quality of communication, trust, respect, transparency, flexibility, governance of the group, to conclude, in fact, that the coordination has to be managed. So we learned that partnership mix, timing, 
and coordination are critical aspects of the efficiency of the partnership. The second part of the question is about key gaps that we need to focus on moving forward. So at this moment, I would dare to talk about financial institution. You know the bad guys. I think that in several projects of skating, it might be very helpful to integrate financial institution in the mixed partnership. We should do it very soon at the design phase of the scaling strategy, and not only at the end to negotiate uh, an interest rate. Okay? Financial institutions need to better understand the farmers, and they have to adapt their product and services accordingly, including specific strategies to reach women. Having access to a loan can help the farmer to adopt an innovation. And I'm not talking about microcredit. I'm talking about credit, agricultural credit. Okay. So having access to a loan can help the farmer to adopt an innovation, but that's not the only advantage. If the financial institution is part of the project, it may help to align the economic interest of all the actors, farmers, their associations, providers, and the financial institutions, and eventually go all in the value chain. In a way, it reinforces the coordination of the partnership. And if they are associated to the project, the financial institutions cannot only be collaborators, but also promoters of a specific process, product, or methodology. So financial institutions can play a larger role than just providing money. Finally, a word about the interest rates and subsidies. Yesterday, a speaker asked, what happens when the project ends? With that in mind, we think that the project should subsidize things that won't be necessary to maintain when the project will be finished. In that perspective, we should subsidize the development, the build-up of the partnership between all actors that will make the scale possible. And consequently, the interest rates should not be subsidized. Yes, they should be negotiated, but they should be sustainable for the partners and for the financial institution. So when we make the cost-benefit analysis of an innovation, we should include the real cost into the equation. In fact, farmers, should also learn to have a, a loan, deal with the financial institution, and think in terms of investment. Even if it's a small investment, that's the key to the progression of their business. If every project subsidizes everything, we do not help the farmers to learn financial strategies. So we have to solve this problem, and I think that the best way to do it is to include financial institutions in the partnership and see the best way to work with them to support the evolution of the agriculture sector through innovation. Thank you very much. Next, we'll have Ignacia. Uh, my question to you is, uh, given the work of Remisp on understanding and improving the strategies to address challenges faced by rural territories in Latin America. What do you think is the major contribution of CIFSURF's work on partnerships that you've heard? And if we were to do this all over again, what would you like to see differently? Well, many thanks, Wendy. Good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you this morning sharing some ideas based on our work at Remis in Latin America. In my comments, I want to, yes, I want to uh, answer the Wendy's question, but I want to emphasize how partnership can contribute to what it seems to me to be the two main talents that lie ahead after the um, finish of the program, the CISFUS 
program. <laughs> it's not uh, easy, the acronym. I, I have to say it is even more difficult than remiss acronym. That is not easy also. <laughs> Uh, so I think I will talk about the fund, okay? <laughs> well, uh, the two main challenges that lie ahead, how to reach more people with these innovations and how to make the results we have seen sustainable over time, I think. Let me begin this comment with a brief reference to the organization I represent. We miss working social applied research for a better understanding of Latin American rural transformation process using a territorial approach that we have developed both conceptual and empirically with a strong support of IDRT. Over the last 10 years, uh, we have made a special efforts to strengthen our policy influencing capacities. It is not enough for us to understand rural development process, but we also want to contribute to changing, to improving them so that the process can be fairer and more inclusive for all people who live in rural areas. We have defined itself, uh, ourselves sorry, as a network since our beginnings. But to improve our policy influencing work, we have developed a concrete strategy, a sort of policy entrepreneurship model that is very intensive in partnership building. And that is why I'm talking to it uh, about it here in this moment. Our approach is based on some principles that I think are very similar than those um, that the fund, the CISFERS, has successfully promoted. Uh, the need to across disciplines, uh, uh, to work across disciplines and sectors to address social complexity, and even more important for us, I think, the need to involve not only researchers, but only civil society organizations, the private sectors, government, and also grassroots organizations from the beginning of the, of the research process. This is an approach intensive in evidence-based policy dialogue between different actors to create and support a demand for specific policies and programs. Based on this experience, what I am thinking about is how the, the fund projects can take advantage of collaborative partnerships, not only to assure high quality research innovations that as we have seen uh, this is achieving, but also to accomplish two additional purposes which would be would make innovation sustainable over the time, to scale up national, international policies of food security and to strengthen the way in which you promote the adoption of this innovation by farmers. That is, something, I think, is something very is important. Let me briefly make a reference to innovation. As we have seen and we have talked during yesterday and today, innovation is not linear and there are not one size fits all solution, yes? But agricultural innovation can be conceived as a social process, a socially constructed process that is the result of the interactions between a multitude of agents and stakeholders. That is why I think it's so important to pay to pay special attention to the quality of interactions among, among agents, and in particular, of the social learning processes that occur during the innovation process. The sustainable adoption of, innovat of an innovative solution requires people to feel a sense of ownership of that innovation. And from this pe perspective, the innovation itself is a product of networks of agents that interact with each other, bring, bringing the resources and capabilities to these interactions. And as a consequence, create a new ways to deal with social and economic processes. So if we turn to this innovation into national policies, or if we want to expand their adoption among farmers, it is very important to deeply involve with governments and with farmers' organizations in collaborative partnerships. This is why, at Remis, we don't reach out to governments only when our research projects are finished, but we engage them in our research process from the beginning. At least in Latin America, governments tend to be a bit suspicious of a solution that has not involved them from the beginning. It is well known that collaborative efforts between researchers and policy uh, makers face a lot of difficulties. I, I insist, at least in Latin America, is the, uh, what we see. More dialogue and collaborative work are definitely needed to improve the mutual understanding between researchers and policy makers in a mutual beneficial manner. And I am afraid that this found is not an exception in this sense and that more efforts need to be made to assure the scaling up and sustainability of the results achieved. By the other side, to promoting social learning, uh, at Remis we are increasingly working with grassroots organizations and not only with universities and civil society organizations as we did it in the past. It's amazing how the quality of solutions improves when people traditionally consider it as beneficiaries 
get involved in the design of the solutions from the beginning. The opportunities and conditions for innovation are unequally, unfortunately, unfortunately unequally distributed, like many other assets and resources, and they are stacked against the rural poor. So those, thus involving them in, a process can in, in this process can increase their sense of ownership of the innovation, increasing in its sustainability over time. But what we are, incre what we are increasingly evidence is this, we cannot just work separately with governments and with farmers. I do not have time to extend this comment, but, we, but I think it's very important that we must engage in dialogue process with the both actors at the same time, with governments and with farmers or grassroots organizations in the same dialogue process uh, to think in innovative solutions. And just to finish, I want to emphasize the importance of m &E, not just to evaluate the innovation solution as a final product, but maybe even more important to monitor the learning process that results from the interaction of different agents and that make the, these results possible. Uh, we really need to improve our understanding of learning process, processes that make innovation possible in a collaborative way. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much to our panelists. And now we'll move to the audience for discussions. I think we have about 25 minutes or so again today. And your questions are similar to as they've been yesterday. What's new and innovative and how can this be applied? And where are the gaps um, and next steps for the future? So we have about 25 minutes for that. And um, we can begin discussions. And again, just recommending people to move around tables. Uh, as we were, were mentioning yesterday, it's, I think the discussions are much richer when you're with different groups of people each day. So, OK, thank you. <laughs> 